Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to gather together in your name. Lord, we know that when we gather in the name of Jesus, you're present in our midst. Heavenly Father, I ask that you would show us your way. Lord, that you would teach us the way that we should live, that you would give us wisdom and grace and empower us to uh, to do the things that enable us to walk in your power, to walk in your kingdom, to experience holiness, to experience intimacy with you. Lord, I thank you for your presence in our lives and for your word that you give to us to lead us in the truth. So Lord, speak to your people. Here we are. Amen. So the title of the message tonight is For Review. For Review. And when uh, you know I was thinking about my time in the military. And I remember one time that, especially when I was brand new, and for those of y'all that weren't uh, Marines, and I don't know how, how if every branch uses this term, but they call a new guy's boots. We're brand new and uh, you're called a boot. And so when I was a boot uh, in my platoon with my, um, with my uh, 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 unit, I was there with my squad and we had pulled out a, a M250 cal, uh, which is a heavy machine gun. That was a machine gunner. And so we'd pull this out and we would do disassembly, reassembly drills. And so the goal was to take the gun apart as quick as you can and then put it back together as quick as you can. And uh, there was one guy, his name was Branson. And Branson was a ninja at taking apart a gun and putting it back together. He could, he could take it apart and put it together blindfolded in less than a minute. And, and it's, there is some challenging parts to it because with a 50 cal machine gun, there's a thing called headspace and timing. And you actually have to get that right and get the, the firing pin in properly for it to fire. So like you can take it apart and put it together. And if you don't get the headspace and timing right and you go to click to test it, you rack it back and then you test it, see if it if it if the trigger causes it to go off. If you don't get the headspace and the timing right, it won't go off. And he could do this in less than a minute blindfolded. I remember one particular time where he actually did just about he did the whole weapon, actually did the whole thing with one hand. And still that was like one minute and 37 seconds. So that, that, was, that was amazing. And we would do these tests over and over again as a part of our proficiency to see how well we were, we were prepared. Because what would happen is, is that if you have a, a jam or if you have a problem and uh, you're on the, the battlefield or you're on the front lines or wherever you are on the range, you need to be able to take that weapon apart, address the issue, put it back together. Or what we'd often do is, is you know, you take the weapon off the vehicle and then you put it on a tripod, put it online and all that stuff. And so that was a very important part of just determining, are you a good machine gunner? Can you even take your weapon apart, put it together? Are you familiar with the components? Do you know how, how everything works? Because in the heat of battle, in the heat of the moment, if you don't know how it works, if you don't get that click, guess what? There's no boom. And if there's no boom, you're going to be in trouble. So uh, reviewing, and this is what we did by way of review. We just, you go in, you get your turn, you go out, you go as fast as you can, you're timed, you're tested, you're tried, and and as we all know, review is really a part of life, isn't it? I mean, or let's put it this way, or it should be, right? I mean, we, we are familiar with on-the-job reviews like performance reviews or peer reviews, right? I mean, anybody ever had that? I mean, anybody ever done one of those 360 peer reviews? I've heard of those. I've never done those, but they actually sit you in a circle and they have your peers one by one just tell you what's up. I got some uh-uhs already. Yeah, I mean, it's a challenging thing and a scary thing, but some people do that. Some people do it anonymous. Sometimes there's an anonymous peer review. I've heard of, uh, like, Netflix will actually do uh, instant reviews. Like, they'll drop you right, they'll, they'll come right in the hallway and give you instant feedback. Uh, they also have a thing where they actually take you out to dinner for the purpose of, we're going to do your review. And so everybody at the table reviews one another. And uh, right there around dinner. So, and sometimes it's good and sometimes it's bad, but ultimately, it's for your good. It's for you to grow. Uh, if you, if you uh, write code, you do a code review. If you uh, uh, want to review your health, what do you do? You do an annual exam or you do a checkup. You know, if, if we uh, are doing finances, we do an audit, right? You want to audit your finances to make sure you know where your money is. I'll never forget when, I st when we first took uh, financial peace with Dave Ramsey and we had to kind of uh, take like a, a diary and you basically I went through all the, the things that I purchased and I went online and I pulled down all the categories and all the stuff and I started breaking it out. And once you start seeing where your money's going, you start thinking, well, wait a second, I'm spending a whole lot of money for us. It was on food, like a whole lot of money on food, you know, and instead of me complaining, I don't have any money. I'm just going to have to say no to McDonald's. Well, it wasn't McDonald's because y'all know McDonald's ain't good, but it was somewhere, right? We was going out somewhere. 
If you like McDonald's, God bless you, but I think that's killing you, so don't eat that. Uh, anyways, <laughs> what about when it comes to our spiritual lives? Do you do you do a review? Do you test yourself? Do you do you look at how you're doing? Um, you know, sometimes we can live for long periods of time without test, seeing how we're doing. You know, I, I know that if, uh, uh, you know, you have a guy and, and say he's in the service and you don't PT after a while, your muscles atrophy and pretty soon you're going to fail your test. If you are not able to, if you're not running consistently, I guarantee you your ability to run, say, a three-mile race or a three-mile uh, 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 length is not going to, to stand up over time. You, you might be good when you're in shape, but you stop working out and you stop you know, eating right and you just start laying around, then pretty soon you're not going to be able to do very much. And it's the same thing with us spiritually. Sometimes we have moments where God shows up and God begins to put his finger on some things. And God begins to touch some things. And so we get excited and we start moving and we start doing things. And then we can go for long periods of time. Where we never stop and we, just, and, and we never say, well, how am I really doing? Right? We go to church, we, we kind of get in the routine of, of religion. You know, we, we have our tithes on automatic payments, so we don't worry about that. We have you know, our, our kind of rituals that we do, our things that we do, uh, and then we kind of coast. You know, it's kind of like when you first move to a place, you, you're, you're paying attention to everything when you're driving because you're like, I don't know where anything is. But then after you know, I mean, how many times have you ever driven and went on autopilot? And like from the time you left your front door to the time you got at your job or got at the school or got somewhere, you're like, I don't know how I got here, but I got here. Praise God, right? This is what happens to us sometimes spiritually is that we get an autopilot and we just kind of do the thing and we're not, we're not experiencing change. We're not experiencing breakthrough. We're not experiencing growth. We're not uh, going into another level. And, and the Bible tells us that we're supposed to go from faith to faith and from strength to strength. And God wants to continuously elevate us. And so if your experience in your relationship with God, or your experience in faith is, is consistent, and I mean just average, if it's just the same from year to year or week to week or month to month, something might be wrong. And because God designed us and created us to come higher, to draw closer, to be transformed, to be transfigured. And so I, I want to I encourage us as we get into this that, that what we want to do is want to take Take review. We want to test ourselves. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 5 through 9. Uh, I'm going to read this from the message translation. The 2 Corinthians chapter 13, 5 through 9 uh, says this. It says, test yourselves to make sure you are solid in the faith. Don't drift along taking everything for granted. Give yourselves regular checkups. You need firsthand evidence, not mere hearsay that Jesus Christ is in you. Test it out. If you fail the test, do something about it. I hope the test won't show that we failed. But if it comes to that, we'd rather the test show that our failure than yours. In other words, as the apostle, he's saying, I, I taught you, I gave you wisdom. Uh, if the test is going to fail, let it be my failure, not yours. You be found in the faith. He says, we couldn't possibly, or we're rooting for the truth to win out in you. We couldn't possibly do otherwise. We don't just put up with our limitations, we celebrate them and then go on to celebrate every strength, every triumph of the truth in you. We pray hard that it will all come together in your lives. He starts off saying, test yourself. You know, make sure that you're solid in the faith. You know, when was the last time you did that? When was the last time you looked at your, your you honestly looked at your faith and said, how am I doing? How, how, how am I doing? Or when was the last time you just looked at your life in general and said, how am I doing? Right? We we sometimes avoid that because I think I think intuitive we were kind of afraid of what the answers might be. Uh I, I have I have done this process of and I'm gonna give you two tools that I use that I've used regularly, consistently, and I try to use them about yearly, um, because it's maybe as much as I can stand. But but I probably should use them a little bit more because they're so revealing, but they really help. And I do what's called a spiritual audit, where I will sit down with a notebook. And I will get on my knees and I'll start asking some questions. And I want to share with you uh, two different audits that I've kind of combined and, and I've kind of used. And the first one comes from a guy named Fred Smith. And actually, this was, a, a, it's called Conducting a Spiritual Audit. It was an article that was written in 1998. It was given to me by uh, a man who was discipling me. His name was uh, Rick DeMarco, and he gave that to me. And I said, okay, I'm going to do this. And so I, we're going to go through some of the questions. 
And uh, what I can do is we can make this available to you in a, in a handout or something later on. But, but I'm going to give you a couple of questions. We're just going to talk through these, and I want you to think about these as we go. Okay, so the first one is, am I content with who I'm becoming? Am I content with who, who I'm becoming? You know, do you like the person you're becoming? Are you becoming more like Jesus? I think I know of people that had a, had a really passionate press into God and they had radical changes in the beginning of their faith. And then something happened and they just kind of got on autopilot and instead of really continuing forward, they kind of stayed where they were. Or in some cases actually went back. Things they used to say, I would never watch this show. I will never do this thing. Now they're, you know, maybe compromised a little bit. Maybe have kind of come back and said, okay, well, it's not that bad. You know, I, I can handle this and this and that. And, and the big question is, is not right or wrong here. It's, is this, is this who I'm supposed to be? Am I happy? Am I content with who I'm becoming? Am I becoming like the person God wants me to be? And then a an, an follow-up question to that is, am I becoming less religious and more spiritual? Am I becoming less religious and more spiritual? It's really easy to be religious. Uh, you can go to you know, a, a church any given Sunday, every Sunday, and everybody would consider you religious. You can bring your Bible. You can have a big fat one like I got. You know, you can run around and be like, look at how holy I am. I got a big Bible, you know. Um, now, this is not mine, but you could, I could get a big one with big words and just say, hey, it's, uh, it's so I can read it better. But, you know, I could use that as an excuse. But here, here's the thing. I, I could use this as a display of how holy I am. I can say the right words. I can know when to say amen in the sermon. I can lift my hands during worship. I can be very religious and not be transformed. Uh, the, the challenge is we're not called to be religious. We're actually called to be transformed, to, to have a thriving, living spiritual life. Before we met Christ, we were dead. We were spiritually dead. But when we met Jesus, we became spiritually alive. And so I'm supposed to be coming more and more like that. I'm supposed to be coming more and more spiritual. Less and less rules-based, less and less, you know, and when we're, when we're young in the faith, when we're brand new, it, we really do kind of need to know no and yes, right? Like with your little kids, you don't elaborate and you don't teach them to do critical thinking. You say, don't touch that, right? Why? Because they're going to get burned or they're going to get shot. You say no, you say yes. But, but the older you get and the more you have the ability to think for yourself and to think critically and consider consequence and reward, the less you need no and yes, and the more you just need freedom to be, to make the right choice, right? So, so that's the question I want to ask you. Are you becoming more religious? In other words, are you, are you, you know, uh, uh, really throwing yourself into the repetition or the ritual of Christianity, or are you becoming more spiritual, actually walking in the ways of Jesus? Uh, and then the next one, and this one's gonna gonna hurt maybe. Uh, does my family recognize the authenticity of my spirituality? I might tack on the end of that, or does only my church family know? You know, does my family recognize the authenticity of my spirituality? You know, if the pastor showed up at your house and started doing a survey of your family members, would they say you're spiritual? That you're growing spiritually? Now, the hard thing with family is, is they see you good, bad, and ugly. And all of us have good, bad, and ugly, right? We're in a process of growth. But what they should see over time is growth, is change, right? I mean, some stuff's going to happen radically and instantly, and some stuff's going to take a while for you to develop and grow. Uh, and so we want to be careful about taking that to the extreme and uh, going and doing an interview with your spouse and saying, hey, you know, pastor was talking, we're doing full review, and... Yeah, you, you're not living up to code. We're doing a peer review right now, and you're failing. Right? Don't do that to your family members, okay? But encourage their growth, amen? All right, next question. Do I have a flow-through philosophy? A flow-through philosophy. In other words, God flowing through my life to others. Is it all about me, or is it about how God can take what he's put into my hands and tell me to give that away? Or use the gifts that I've been given, not for my own good, but so that God can flow through me to bless other people? One, one sure sign of immaturity is selfishness. And if you haven't grown past a spiritual selfishness, then, then you, you are 
are probably in need of some change. And we hear it all the time. You know, I, y'all don't play the music I like. You don't sing the songs the way I want to sing them. You don't, I, I, I want, I have my chair and you make me move. Pastor, I like to sit in the back and you tell me to sit up front. You know, I park here or I do this or, or the, I don't like how the kids do or I don't like, well, okay, amen, I hear you. But is it about you? You know, are these things that critical? That for the sake of someone else or for the sake of overall, is it about you? You know, that's why like when we do worship songs, for instance, we do songs that are congregational based so that congregation can get involved. You notice we don't have a lot of uh, uh, individual singers just singing, singing a song that's all about their, their skill and their ability. It's the team. And what the team is doing is leading us to God, not, not making it about you watch while I perform. Right? Because, because if, I, if we cater to that selfishness, we're actually catering to an immaturity. All right? So that's, that's something to think about. In your life, do you have a flow-through philosophy? Uh, n- next one, do I have a quiet center to my life? Do I have a quiet center to my life? Or is your life always chaotic? And I know that you know, if, you're, if you're a parent and you've got little ones, it can definitely feel like your life is always chaotic. But there should be a place where you're able to get alone with God and just get peace and, and internally have, have a quiet center, uh, a non-anxious presence. Jesus was never anxious. He was never rushed. The crowds pushed in on him, and he walked right through them. They wanted to stone him. They wanted to throw him, and he was just like, can't touch this. I mean, he walked right through. I would love to see like video of how that happened because it's like they're trying to grab him and he just walks through like nothing's happened. I don't know if there was like an invisible force field. I don't know if they parted like the the Red Sea, but the Bible says he just walked right through them. I don't know how that works, but that's pretty amazing. I mean, y'all remember when they came for him in the garden and they said, he said, who y'all looking for? They're like, I'm looking for Jesus. And he said, I am he. And what happened? They fell down like they got knocked down by power. I wonder if the same thing happened when he started walking. They just, you know, who knows? But but he was never, never pressured by the people, by the environment, by the circumstances. He was never pressured by the news or, or whatever was going on. And, and here's the thing. If we don't have a quiet center, then it's easy for us to feel the pressure of everything else. Or to come into a room. You ever come into a room and, and maybe a spouse or, or maybe a, a co-worker, like you can feel like the in the air. And the minute you walk in there, it gets on you. It like jumps on you. Now you're all agitated. You're all crazy. You know, we, when we have a quiet center, it defends us. It keeps us. It protects us from getting caught up in that stuff. Next one. Uh, and this is important. Have I defined my unique ministry? Have I defined my unique ministry? God has something unique for you. And I believe that that the way that God um, operates most commonly in in terms of our ministry gifts is part of that is leveraged in the church for his body and the rest of that is leveraged in the world for the advancement of the kingdom. So it's not either or. It's not not either or. It's both and. It's not, your ministry is not all about church. Amen? Your ministry is not all about the world either. Amen? It's both. It's both. You have a place in the family, right? And every family member has responsibilities, don't they? Right? And then, and then you have a place as, a, as, a, as an ambassador or as an emissary of God's kingdom to reach the lost, to reach people outside of the family with your gifts. It's called the family business, right? Didn't Jesus say that? Be about my family, my father's business. And the Bible says that we're heirs and co-heirs with Christ. We enter into his works. We become partakers of the family business. So we, we take care of home responsibilities in the church, and then we take care of the family business outside of the church. But you have gifts. You've got unique contribution. You've got things that no one else has. You have got a calling on your life. You've got a specific personality and a specific skill set and a specific, specific anointing to make a difference. Have you considered that? Have you thought about that? And if you have, well, what are you doing to cultivate that? How are you growing that? How are you taking steps in that? Or are you waiting for you know, God to speak to me and then me call you and say, hey, there's a gift on your life, like when are you going to use it? Or me call you and say, hey, I know you've got this. Use it here. No, God is calling us. He's given us something and we just take what he's given us and we start using it where we are. Right? All right, is everybody okay? 
All right, so next one. Uh, is my prayer life improving? Is it improving? There's an assumption that Jesus has that all Christians pray. Did you know that? He, he said, when you pray, pray this way. So Jesus expected us to be praying people. He never said, if you pray. You know, if you feel like praying, or he said, when you pray, this is how you should do it. And he, he taught us how to pray. Right? That's, that's crazy because you all know that that, uh, that is the one question the disciples asked. They didn't ask, teach me how to preach. They didn't ask, teach us how to, how to cast out devils. They said, Lord, please teach us how to pray. So there was something about the prayer life of Jesus that got their attention. Because when he prayed, things happened. That'd be like going to Elijah, Elijah, right? I mean, Elijah called down, you know, I mean, think about Elijah. Elijah was a man of prayer. That's why James says Elijah was what the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. He said Elijah was a person just like us. He got stirred up like us. He had sensibilities like us. But when he prayed, God responded. The heavens were shut up and then he prayed again and the heavens opened up and it rained down. Elijah was such a man of God. I, this is one of those, those funny stories, too, in the Old Testament, that the king sends 50 armed soldiers to come after him. And they say, oh, man of God, the king says you better come. And he said, if I'm a man of God, let fire fall from heaven. I don't know what that looked like, but it was like, Whoa! and they all died. All of them. The next 50 comes out. Man of God, the king says you need to come. He said, oh, yeah, if I'm a man of God, let fire come from heaven. Whoa! I mean, could you imagine, like, I, does that look like laser beams? Does that look like volcano? I, I have no idea. But 50 men lost their lives because of the attitude. The third guy was like, listen, don't, don't, don't kill me. The king wants to see you. Please come. And he didn't call fire on that dude. But, I mean, Elijah prayed. And when he prayed, it stopped raining. When he prayed, it started raining. When he prayed, fire fell. And James, the apostle, goes so far into the Bible to say, listen, you're just, he's just like you. You have an anointing. Matter of fact, it's better for you because you have the Holy Spirit on the inside of you. You have the promises of God's word. He didn't have all that. We have that. We have God in us and God with us and the sure promises of God's word that we can stand on. So let me ask you, is your prayer life improving? You know, when we start out and we start praying, it's real simple, right? Father, please bless me. Father, please bless the food, right? Father, please do this. But as we develop our, our ability to have a conversation, as we develop our vocabulary, then our prayers become a little bit more like normal conversations that we would have with grown people. Does that make sense? Again, we're looking for maturity here. We're not looking for perfection. You never reach the prayer perfect point, I don't think, unless your name is George Mueller or, uh, you know, or Ian Bounds. Those, good, those guys, if you want to go into history and see some crazy prayer answer and stuff, those guys, maybe Reese Howells, another guy, intercessor, go check that book out. It's amazing. Okay, next one. Have I maintained a genuine awe of God? Have I maintained a genuine awe of God? Does God still blow your mind? Does God still, like, just grab your attention? Or, or when you come to worship on a Sunday or you come to worship in a service, is it just like, okay, let's get the music done so we can get the word so we can get out of here? Or is it, or is it you know, I, I'm just going to, you know, okay, we're going to sing our songs and then we're going to move on and no big deal. Or do you come like, God is going to be here. Do you come expecting God to heal somebody? Do you come expecting God to speak to you? Do you come expecting, and when he does, are you like, God is talking to me? When you read the word of God, does it jump out of the page and you stop and say, this is the God of all the universe. Stop right now. And he's talking to me. This is crazy. I mean, that's how I feel. Every time something grabs, I'm like, God, you can't get more ridiculous. I mean, this is amazing. Have you, have you, or, or has God become like, what up? You know? And there's a, there's a danger. I know there's a, there's a movement and there's kind of a people praying and, and sometimes they call God Papa, you know, based on the Aramaic term Abba, Abba Father. And I think that that is, that is interesting. It's, it's important because it conveys the intimacy. God is our, our Father, but more than our Father. You know, some of y'all may have heard, heard Daddy, Daddy God, right? Anybody ever heard somebody pray that way? Daddy God? Um, there's, there's a danger in that too. Because what that does is that, is that actually... Uh, it diminishes the awe and grandeur of who God is. 
we, we can make that to where I'm so comfortable and I'm so chill and my daddy God loves me and I could just, eh, it's all right, where, where I lose the fear of dad. Does that make sense? The fear of the father. So we want to have a genuine reverence and awe for God. And, and if we've lost that, something's wrong. Because every time we come into God's presence, Ecclesiastes tells us, draw near to hear. And when God speaks to us, everything can change. One word from God can change your life. One experience in His presence can totally reverse everything that you've ever done wrong. One moment in God's presence can flip everything around. One moment can bring clarity. One moment can bring deliverance. One moment can fill your heart with love and your, your eyes with tears. One moment God can show Himself so great, so big in your life that everything is different. But if you lose the fear of God, if you lose the awe and the reverence for God, then I'm afraid that you miss some of the most important parts of what makes life with God awesome. All right, next one, because i got to move on. Uh, is my humility genuine? Or is it fake? Let me move at the next one. Is my spiritual feeding the right diet for me? Is my spiritual feeding the right diet for me? I'm going to use a, a simple one. Now, I'm not against this, so, so don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But, but uh, the Bible app is an amazing app produced by Life, LifeChurch.tv. Those guys, Reg Rochelle, those guys are amazing. And they've blessed the world by making multiple translations of the Bible available in a simple-to-use app. Uh, but one of the things that I, I don't actually like so much about the Bible app is w some of their quote-unquote reading plans. Their reading plans are devotionals. They're not Bible reading plans, though they're spoken of as Bible reading plans. Some of them. Some of them are actually legit Bible reading plans. But here's the thing. If my spiritual feed, if I say, did you read the Bible today? Oh, yeah, I read my Bible reading plan in the Bible app. And it's, uh, it's the topic is fear, how to overcome fear. And, and so if I were to look at that and I would see, one verse on fear and three pages on somebody's story. Okay, Am I feeding my soul with the Word of God? But I feel like I am, don't I? Because I'm doing my Bible reading plan. I'm not saying those things are wrong, but those things are supplemental. They're like vitamins that you add to the real, to the real food. Amen? The Word of God is the real food. The, 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 the things that you listen to, podcasts or, or sermons online or or any of those things, are meant to feed you in a proper way. Now, there's another thing, too. We can get off balance, right? You can, you know, one of the reasons why explorers got scurvy is because they didn't get iron in their diet. Pretty sure that's what it was. They, the, like I was talking about uh, Amundsen and Scott and, and uh, um, Shackleton uh, this past weekend. Shackleton, you know, those guys had, they had to bring, um, they had to kill fresh, because what they did is they were only eating fish. And they actually had to, to, to kill meat or bring meat so they could get iron so they wouldn't get scurvy. And it's the same thing spiritually. We can eat the same type of thing and get so lopsided in our nutrition in one way that we're not, we're not getting everything that we need. Right? It's like if I only picked one, one book of the Bible and only read that. Or, I, you know, some people uh, in some places, they only read the New Testament. I heard... Um, um, I want to say it was uh, Kenneth Hagin back in the day, like said, you don't really need the Old Testament because God gave us the New Testament. And, and I might be misquoting him, but here's the thing. You need both. We need old and new. We, we, you know, the early church only had the Old Testament. So that had to have been good enough. Right? We need to not only hear messages on things we like, like prosperity or financial blessing. Those are great things. Listen to those things but also balance it out with the cross and holiness and suffering, right? We, my, my point is, is that if, if we're not eating properly, spiritually speaking, then our, our spiritual health is at risk. All right, next one. Is obedience in small matters built into my reflexes? This is, this is bigger than we know. Is obedience in small matters built into my reflexes? Let's put it another way. Jesus said, if you're faithful with little, you'll be what? Faithful with much. So how, how do we know if, how do I know if I'm ready for more? I'm faithful with what I have right now. How, how many of us know somebody? 
Now, somebody might be us, but how many, how many of us know somebody that's waiting to do something until they get to the thing? Instead of taking advantage of what they have right now. You know, they know, they're, they're, everybody knows that they could be doing more, but they're waiting for their shot. And when, they ask, when someone asks them, hey, can you set up tables or can you move chairs? They're like, nah, I, can't, I can't be there for that. No, I'll be there for the main event. You want me to sing? You want me to be on stage? You want me to do this? You want me to do that? I got you. You want me to come clean the church? Nah, man, I can't do that. I'm too busy. Right? Or little things. I mean, you know what I'm talking about. Little, they can't do little things. Is obedience in small matters built into my reflexes? You know, if God says something, do I do it then? Or do I wait? I want to get to that point where, where uh, as they say in the Marine Corps, obedience is, in, or, or uh, what is it? Instant, willful obedience to orders. When Jesus speaks, instantly I do it. Instantly. I choose to do what he says. And then the last question for this. Do I have joy? Nehemiah tells us that the joy of the Lord is my strength. And I feel that so many people lack strength because they lack joy. It's, it's hard to go on when you're not happy, when you don't have joy flowing in your life. And we know that joy comes from the presence of the Lord. The Bible says, in your presence is fullness of joy and pleasures evermore. So what, what is one way that we can get joy in our life? If we're lacking joy, how do we get more joy? What did the verse say? In your presence is joy. So how do I get more joy in my life? I get in the presence of God. I, I know it's simple. But it's sometimes so simple that we overlook it. And we chase all these things and God's like, no, no, no. Joy is in my presence. You come spend some time with me, I guarantee you, you get an infusion of joy in your life. So we want to prepare the way for change. If we've, if, we've, um, if we've looked at ourselves and kind of done a review and decided that we're, we're not where we want to be, or, or and I can be honest with you that in my life there are areas where I'm not where I want to be. I constantly try to review things and say, well, in this area I want to get better, in this area I want to do stronger, in this area I want to learn more about, these things I want to grow in. And so we should always be in this continuum of change. We should always be pressing in to become more and more like Jesus. Hosea 10, 12, I love this verse. It says, sow for yourselves righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord till he comes and rains righteousness on you. He says, sow for yourselves righteousness, reap in mercy. Do the right things and find mercy. Break up the fallow ground. You know what the fallow ground is? Fallow ground is when, when the plot of land is hardened. And it needs, you know, before a, a farmer can plant, they have to break that hard soil off to get to the bottom of that uh, so that way they can sow seed in fertile places. And, and he, here the prophet is saying, listen, you break up the fallow ground. You break it. So that when it, and seek the Lord because when he comes, he'll pour out his blessing on you. But if your heart is hard, if your ground is hard, then you're not going to receive what God has for you. So he starts saying, this is what I want you to do. I want you to break up those hard things. So I'm going to give you a, a two lists, and I'll go through these a little bit faster, uh, that these come from Charles Finney. And uh, if you want to uh, read a great little book, it's Lectures on Revival of Religion. This comes out of the third lecture. This is something he preached in 1835. Um, he comes up with two areas uh, that really gum us up, that really stop us up. And the first one is sins of omission. Sins of omission. And if you don't know what a sin of omission is, it's something you, you did not do, but you should have done. I should have done this, but I didn't do it. That's an omission. So let me give you some of those things. These, these are straight from him. Ingratitude. Ingratitude. When was the last time you should have been thankful for something, but instead you, you weren't? The next one, he says, want of the love of God. When was the last time you, you should have poured out your love on God and you were just kind of cold and indifferent? Next one, the neglect of the Bible. 
When was the last time you should have read your Bible, but you didn't? You chose something else. Or if you've just not really spent much time in it. Another one, unbelief. You know, we, we honor God through our belief. We actually dishonor Him through unbelief. We withhold our trust. Next one, the neglect of prayer. You know, when we're not praying, we're sinning. Which is a hard thing. Uh, then the next one, neglect of the means of grace. And what he's talking about is sacraments and specifically including the church. There are plenty of people that neglect fellowship. They neglect communion. They neglect you know, Bible reading and community. And then the next one he says is the manner in which you've performed those duties. You know, when you, when you served, did you serve without faith or without passion? Or did every time you serve the Lord, every time you're in, you know, whatever, minute, say you're a greeter, and every time you serve, were you serving with joy and were you serving with excellence? Were you serving with passion for the Lord? Or were you like, yeah, I'm at the door today? And next one, he says, you're one of love for the souls of your fellow man. And the next one comes with that. You're one of care for the heathen. I mean, do you care about what's happening to other brothers and sisters in the faith that's happening in the world? I highly recommend that if you don't check it out, check out a website called Voice of the Martyrs. Voice of the Martyrs tracks active martyrs, Christians that are being killed and persecuted for their faith right now. There are many of our brothers and sisters in the faith, in the Lord, uh, in India that are, that are being killed. Right now, because they believe in Jesus. Churches being attacked and being burned to the ground. Pastors being beaten in front of their families and killed. China persecuted. Many places around the world. Do we even care? I know we do, but do we? Do we enough to actually pray about it or try to get involved about it, involved in it? Right? Or, or do we pray for the lost? Or just complain about them? Or just be glad we're not one of them anymore? And he says, your neglect of family duties. You know, it pleases God when you, when you honor your family, when you bless your family, when you take time to be family. God created family for a purpose. And neglecting family is not so good. And, and it's one of those things nowadays that it's so easy to do, right? Because we have these little devices. You know, it's still funny if you go to a restaurant. I know we haven't had much chance to go to restaurants lately, but if you sit down, I mean, how many times are you seeing like a whole family right across from each other. And sometimes they're texting each other from across the table. Next one, your neglect of social duties. Next one, your neglect of watchfulness over your own life. Are you, are you, you know, self-care? Are you taking care of yourself? Sometimes we, we get so others focused, we serve other people that we never take care of ourselves. And that's not good. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. You need to take care of yourself. Uh, but then also the next one is neglect to watch over your brethren. It's kind of like that thing. I don't know if y'all have seen this, but on the news um, here in the last month or so in Philadelphia, a woman was being raped on a train and no one called 911. No one stepped up. No one did a thing. You know what? That happens not to that same degree, but sin happens in brothers and sisters' lives that we know of, and we don't step in and say, hey, this is going to kill you. What are you doing with your life? Why are you making those decisions? Why are you hanging out with that part? Don't do these things. These things will hurt you. And we say, no, nah, it's not my business. No, it is your business. You don't control people, but you serve people, and you encourage them to get away from things that would hurt them. And then the last one of omission, neglect of self-denial. And in our, in our culture, in our society, that's like the exact opposite of what you're told to do. Do everything to make yourself happy. No, Jesus says it's better for us to deny ourselves. And then the next category, and I'm going to go through these much faster, sins of commission. These are things that we have done, but we shouldn't have done. So with these two lists, what I do is, is kind of like what I see a lot of y'all doing, writing them down. And what I do is I take that notebook, I take this list, and I take a notebook, and I pray. And I say, Holy Spirit, um, help me go through this. 
and I answer the questions as honestly as I can. And then when I'm reading through these sins of commission and sins of omission, I say, Holy Spirit, if I'm doing one of these, show me. And then for everyone, every one I've done, I write it down. And then, and then after we get to the end of that list, I repent. And I ask God to help. And I make an effort to not do those things. Okay? So sins of commission. Things we should have done or we have done but should not have done. Worldly mindedness. This is, this is setting my mind on things uh, uh, of the flesh, on things that matter more in the world than, than on kingdom things. I'm spending more time focused on everything but God. Uh, next one, pride. When I walked in pride. The one after that, envy. When I envied somebody. I shouldn't, I shouldn't have envied, but I did. When we envy something, we're saying that God, we don't trust God for our provision. I want what you have, and somehow you got it, and I don't have it, so I feel like I need that. God, why aren't you providing for me? The next one, sens censoriousness or evil speaking in today's language. Evil speaking. It's real easy to ha easy to do. Get get involved in around the water cooler, you know, uh, in the car after you had a bad experience with somebody. Evil speaking. Next one, slander. Talking bad about somebody behind their back. Slander is like character assassination. It's you're you're killing somebody's reputation. It's dangerous. Uh, levity is the next one, which is a lack of seriousness. Some people just refuse to take the things of God seriously or to take life seriously. And it's just a joke and it's just, eh, it's all right. It'll... And that's, that's dangerous. That's not, that's not good. You, the Bible tells us to walk soberly in this life, to walk with wisdom, to be wise, to know what the hour is. Uh, lying, cheating, hypocrisy. I like what uh, uh, Woost translation says. That word hypocrisy in the Greek can be play actor on the stage of life. Because they wore masks. And that's what a hypocrite does. Wears a mask. The next one, robbing God. And we know that that comes in the form of tithe, but it also comes in, in when God asks you to give you your time or your talent or your treasure, and we don't. We withhold it. Uh, next one, bad temper. And, and probably the way James would say it in James chapter 1, outbursts of anger, outbursts of wrath. And then here's the next one, the last one, uh, hindering others from being useful. Sometimes we're the reason why somebody won't serve or we're the reason why somebody won't give or we're the reason why someone won't pray or someone won't do something for God that, that God called them to do. And that's a sin when we stop people from doing what they were supposed to do. So, as we wrap up, but just, you know, here's the thing. If you would, you know, if you would do a self-review, then you'd find the mercy of God. God will come to you. God will change you. God will lift you to a higher place. God will deliver you. God will empower you. He'll take you, I love as scripture says, out of the miry clay and set you on the rock of salvation. In Job, this is the way it's said in Job 11, 13 through 20. In the message, it says, still, if you set your heart on God and reach out to him, if you scrub your hands of sin and refuse to entertain evil in your home, You'll be able to face the world unashamed and keep a firm grip on life, guiltless and fearless. Wouldn't that be great to have unashamed, to be unashamed and have a firm grip on life, both without guilt and without fear? He says, you'll forget your troubles. They'll be like old faded photographs. Your world will be washed in sunshine, every shadow dispersed by the day spring. Full of hope, you'll relax, confident again. You'll look around, sit back and take it easy expansive, without a care in the world, you'll be hunted out by many for your blessing. But the wicked will see none of this. They're headed down a dead-end road with nothing to look forward to. Nothing. What did he say? He said, if, if you'll do that, still, if you'll do this. If you'll do this. If you'll come. People don't change because they experience something. They change because they evaluate the experience they have and they act differently. This is why we get in patterns, we've got, we get in habit loops, we do the same thing over and over and over again, and we, we feel bad about it, but we go back to it. Why? Because we're not stopping and saying, what do I need to do differently? What is, what is in my environment that's causing me to do this? What is triggering my emotions? What is, what is provoking me to act in such a way, and how do I avoid that next time? Father, how do I receive help from that? How do I get Holy Spirit to move in me and speak to me when things are about to get this way? How can I change? 
when it comes to our salvation, the Bible admonishes us. It tells us in, it, it, that we're supposed to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. That's a serious command. And when we do, the Bible says that God will work in us so that we will want to, will both desire or want to do what pleases Him. We'll be able to, we'll want to, and we'll be able to. And that's Philippians chapter 2, 12 and 13. That, that we work out our fear. So our job is to work out our salvation. We do the work. But as we do the work, God gives us the desire to do the right thing and God gives us the ability to do the right thing so that He actually does the work in us. Does that make sense? And the fruit of a relationship with Jesus is a transformed life. And all of us should be changed. You know, from, from you know, 2021, January 2021 to January 2022, somebody, if they know you, should notice a difference. It may not be a great difference, but it should be a difference. They should say, boy, when you, you used to pray, you know, if I could say this, you used to pray a certain way, but now when you pray, well, I feel some, there's some fire on that thing. You know, when you, when you talk, you talk with a passion about God. What happened? Did you have an encounter? Like, what's going on? There should be a change. Or you're just nicer than you used to be, right? I feel like as I'm getting older and God's working on me, I'm getting the kindness a little bit better, right? Because my first move is not that. So Jesus had really been working on my heart on that. I'm getting better. But God wants us to have a life that's full of peace and joy and holiness. He's, his blessing uh, is, is attracted to those who live according to his way. So then you want to review yourself. Are you living in God's way? You know, if you want the blessing of God to be attracted to your life, live in his way. Scripture is calling us to examine ourselves and be sure that we're in the faith. So do that. This is because the life that we live now is going to continue on into eternity. You know, and, and here's the thing. We're all going to stand before the Lord and give an account for our lives. Now, the, the thing is, is that if we're in faith, then what's going to happen is we're going to be able to, to give a report with joy. Because we're going to receive a reward. I mean, you ever you ever done that? Remember when you were a little kid or something, and your mom or dad told you, if you do this, you're going to get a toy or you're going to get this. And what you, you were so happy. I'm, you were waiting for them to come home so you get to I did it. Right? Because you knew there was going to be a reward attached. This is what life of faith means. When we stand before the Lord, I can be happy because, I, oh, I did that, Lord. I did what you said. I was there. And God said, yes, you did. Here's your reward. But if I don't live a life of faith, then in that day, I'm going to have great sorrow. And unfortunately, I'm going to receive judgment. So God rewards the faith, uh, the works of faith, the faith that we have. God rewards works of faith. And so it's a good time to review where you stand. How are you doing? You know, where do you stand and how do you stand? You know, break it down. Look at your own life. Make sure that you're in position to receive all the things that God has for you. God wants to bless you. The question is, will you position yourself to be blessed? Are you, are you right? I mean, do you know? And there's other things you can do. There's one thing that I've done in the past too, and, and uh, I've done it, I can't remember which book recommended this, but I've done this before, and you can do this as well, is you can pick, say, five or ten people who really know you, and maybe even three who like really, really know you, and just say, hey, can you, can you give me some feedback on, the, on these things? Based on your knowledge of me, how am I doing here? How am I doing here? You know, when you see me, you know, and you got to pick people that know you and will tell you the truth, people that love you. But when, when you say, can you tell me, what, what, when you see me, you know, and if I said prayer life, what would you say? And if they're like, I don't, I don't know. Or if they're like, you're kidding, right? Then obviously you know something's wrong, right? Get people that you trust. You know, there's, there's a, a, something I heard, you're six. You ever heard of that? Get your six? Do you know when you die, you're going to have six people that's going to carry your coffin? Who are your six? Is it going to be some strangers or is it going to be six people you know? Now, ladies, generally that's not going to be y'all six because six ladies don't normally carry them coffins. But the point, the idea is the same. Who's your six? Six people that know you, six people that love you, six people that would be the six people that you would want carrying your coffin when you die. Now, think about all those things. Evaluate your life. Take a review. Take a moment to do a spiritual audit. And then map out a plan. How can I change with the help of the Holy Spirit? And I promise you that people will begin to take notice of you. That like it said in Job, if I will seek the Lord, if I will go to these things, things begin to open up, blessing begins to come, and people are going to come to me because I'm so blessed. People are going to come to you because you're so blessed. Why? Because we are evaluating our lives, we're looking at ourselves honestly, and we're positioning ourselves to be in the kingdom. Amen? Amen. All right, so I want to pray and uh, close us out here. And... Uh, I want to ask God to help us. 
because this is a this is a kind of a uh, more challenging thing if we're going to be honest with ourselves. So, Father, I pray that you would help us to do this honestly, to not justify our actions or justify uh, our behaviors, but to see clearly uh, what you see in us in these different categories. Lord, and whether it be the spiritual audit from Fred Smith or whether it be the different types of sins from Charles Finney or some other you know, questions that we lay out that are consistent with what you expect from us and what we expect as people of God. Lord, I pray that you would help us go through these times of evaluation, that we take a review, take stock of where we are, that we work out our salvation with fear and trembling so that we can receive the reward laid up for the righteous. Father, I pray that you enable us to not, um, to not be religious, to not, to not satisfy our conscience by, because we can say, oh, I was there and I said the right thing and I did the right thing, but we did it the wrong way, with the wrong heart, with the wrong attitude. Lord, help us be only content in our Christ-likeness. And Lord, in the areas that we don't know that we're not like Jesus, I pray that you reveal. Lord, they're called blind spots for a reason because we can't see them. So Lord, I pray that you would help us to see what you see. And whether that be through trusted friends or whether that be through the voice of the Holy Spirit or whether it be just through the mirror of God's word, Lord, I pray that you would speak to every one of us so that we can truly find ourselves firmly planted on the faith, in the faith, on the rock, but I ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Hallelujah.